and I would love to take our audience back to um, 1982 when you when you experienced that encounter with God in your in your bedroom at three in the morning. Uh, would you take us there and just what was that like? What preceded that? Two days before that, I was going out to do a mission. Uh, it was supposed to be a 12 hour flight. We had an aircraft uh, engine malfunction. We had to shut the number one engine down, the left outboard engine, and came back in to make, make an emergency three engine landing. We were overweight because we had a lot of extra fuel that we couldn't dump. So we're coming in way faster than normal. And when things go wrong at those speeds, it's 135 knots when we touch down. That's over 155 miles an hour. Uh, they happen in a hurry at those speeds. And the next thing I know, we're departing the runway because the pilot used incorrect rudder. And he's inducing the swerve, not help countering the swerve that we expected. Because you have two engines pulling on one side, one on the other. You, you know you're going to go to the right. Uh, more force over there slowing you down. So you got to correct that. He He just corrected incorrectly <laughs> and uh the next thing i know we're, we're headed right at the fire truck and then i had a, all kinds of spiritual things happen in the middle of that and i didn't understand any of it uh we ended up barely missing the fire truck going all the way and ended up on the other runway the, the parallel runways we literally rolled out on a different runway and uh so that affected me a lot because i didn't understand all the spiritual things that had happened to me in the middle of running off the runway and uh just kind of was shocked by it and um and then two days later i'm watching it uh uh in the middle of the night after a prayer after having seen something on television earlier that i thought was a miracle i just had a great a prayer of genuine gratitude for having seen my first miracle not knowing everything's a miracle at the time i'm only 24 years old uh i didn't know that yet you know <laughs> i went to sleep um Next thing I remember, uh, I don't know what, it was probably 2.30, 2 3.30 in the morning. We call it oh, dark 30 in the military. There was no uh, warning or didn't die, like die and go through a tunnel and because I died in my sleep or something. It was just an instantaneous shift. Boom. All of a sudden, I'm standing in the throne room of creation, witnessing God's light pouring out and blasting through me. And I experienced infinite power th that was perfectly balanced and under absolute control. Infinite power. There was infinite unconditional love also on a cosmic scale, on an infinite scale. And a, uh, there was infinite wisdom and infinite intelligence, and they're one and the same because you can't have one without the other. And, and it was like God's throwing this cosmic scale party because Tony's back. It was all because it felt like it was all because Tony was back. And it and I was the most precious thing that ever existed in God's eyes. And the best analogy I've ever been able to come up with about what that love feels like, um, any mother will know this. The first time they held their baby, when, right after it was born and looking at its face, they know what the definition of precious means in their hearts, not in their intellect, in their hearts, right? And so that's what God was expressing to me, what I meant to him in his heart for all of us. And But to the, my best analogy on what that's like is imagine... It's the end of the history of the entire universe. It's trillions and trillions of years have gone by, right? And you're, I was being, it was like I was being loved, held, and cradled by every mother in every galaxy that ever lived everywhere, every when, in that whole window of time all at once. And then as great as that sounds, that analogy absolutely stinks. I could speak like that every day, 24 hours a day for a billion years, and it still won't even begin to tell you the truth. And so that really rocked my world. Then I saw these hands. I'm focused on the light. That's all I cared about. You know, I just wanted to go be in the light and stay there. That's, I didn't couldn't think about anything else. I had a wife next to me and a three-year-old son in the next room and uh, no consideration for them at all, only because you can't. Your mind and your consciousness is overwhelmed with all of this. And um, so I, I ignored the hands because I didn't care about them, right? Uh, 
And then I start seeing the room coming in from the behind, like peripheral vision, as the room starts to rematerialize, I guess. I don't know how else to say it, or come into vision. And and then I I could see that it was my arms that were out. I had raised my arms up and sat up in bed. The light was coming through the wall at the end of the room, and I'm staring at it, and I'm realizing that my wife's, I could see her feet. I could tell by the position of her feet her back was to me. And I remember thinking, how, how can she sleep through all this? It's like a billion stars in here. And it's so bright. Nobody can sleep through this. And then I realized this was real. And the instant God knew I knew it was real, the light shrunk down, not immediately, but kind of like two or three seconds just and closed out. Didn't No sound. But uh, that's the moment I just, my heart broke because I just wanted to stay in the light. But there was this residual energy kind of still in the wall. Um, and I just sat there begging it to come back in my mind and crying the rest of the night till the sun came up. And then when my wife came to me and I woke up, she didn't know, you know, she didn't know something. She knew something was wrong. I explained it to her. And um, I know she believed me because I don't, you know, that's not my nature to do what happens, right? And, uh, and cry like that. And so uh, first thing in the morning when you, sit up in bed you know you just don't that's not what a naval aviator does <laughs> and uh, so later we went to the church a week you know a few days later and i tried to get an answer there um and i i talked to the it was a guest pastor that week and i went to up to him and talked to him after the just privately one-on-one -on -one after the um uh, church that day and told him enough that he understood what happened to me uh not understanding yet at the time that the Monday afternoon where we ran off the runway was connected to the Thursday prayer. I didn't know that yet. I'm just talking about Thursday to him because I hadn't figured it all out yet. This is so fresh. And uh, so he just kind of looked at me and tilted his head and gave me an odd expression and, on his face and turned his back on me and walked off. Didn't tell me anything. And of course, I'm stunned again. Uh, and then about a week later or so, we went to a different church because I still need answers and I'm going to go find them. I'm pretty, uh, pretty dogged about that. <laughs> and uh, and I'm at, there's this period in time in the church, this church, it was a bigger church and it was closer to the base. And there was a lot of military that went there. Right. And I didn't even consider that. I just wanted to go get answers. So my wife's sitting next to me and there was this period of time where uh pastor at the church there's probably five six hundred people in this church uh says is there are there any concerns you know how they do that for a few minutes and they'll pray for the concerns and i i'm getting ready to get up and ask my question and my wife grabs my wrist by both with both her hands like that to keep me <laughs> and i yank my arm away first i was confused i looked i'm like and i look at her i'm like what and then i realized what she's doing and i said let go of me I'm real loud and the whole church heard it and saw it and then i asked my question and i got a lame answer that was vague knowing he didn't have the answer at that time so then i just didn't say anything else and we left after the church and there were a, a lieutenant commander pilot from another squadron who knew i was air crew uh came up to me and said uh you may not want to talk about that anymore because if the Navy finds out about it, they're probably going to uh, kick you out of the Navy or at the very least, you're going to lose your security clearance and won't be able to fly anymore. And that was it. I, I clammed up and didn't talk about it for a long time. And uh, that's where the moral injury happened. Uh, and it created decades long problems for me. Uh, and, and, but ultimately, because of Lily, I was telling you about her earlier. She connected me with uh, uh, a lady that worked with the, the Johns Hopkins University, uh, and they collected 18 people's near-death experience stories, and mine was one of them that was selected. And you can download this for free. Uh, just just uh, uh, do an internet search on the words "health care after a near-death experience," and you'll find it. And it's uh, fascinating. And the purpose of the article, this was in March of 2020 when it was released. 
It's a narrative inquiry in bioethics. And I believe they're still taking feedback. And so they're asking frontline providers, like the ones that we went to, clergy, you know, uh, doctors, whatever, they're asking for feedback. And they're taking that feedback and their, their purpose is to create a medical school curriculum at Johns Hopkins University for uh, near-death experience patients and a clinical protocol to go out to the rest of the world on how to handle someone who has just possibly had a near-death experience so that you don't create that moral injury simply out of lack of knowledge. They don't understand that uh, when you have a spiritual experience, a, there are profound after effects that take, take a long time to work through. And if they're not handled well in the beginning, it can really just cause a lot of problems. And it's not uncommon that a lot of uh, experiences end up divorced later and things like that because of that attitude, you know. And it's just one of uh, lack of understanding. And it's just an education problem. Just need to educate the people on what, what happens to people and how to handle it right. So no matter what their beliefs are, there should be a certain way to deal with that and, uh, and standardize it. That's what's happening. To to be sensitive to your to your spiritual experience, and I, it's hard for me to imagine that a lot of people would be understanding or sensitive to those experiences. Mainly because I believe of like what's called cognitive dissonance. It challenges it, that experience challenges mm -hmm. their own <laughs> view so severely so extremely well wait till you have one and you think your challenge is your worldview has been challenged it hasn't been challenged yet when you have your first real experience and and your whole concept of what i for me my whole concept of what i thought was reality totally got wiped out from under my feet the foundation that i had for that was gone and and i've had to rebuild it ever since so this is where i'm at today it's so beautiful what you experienced there in the presence of that light, unconditional love. Just to, just to think about yes, that, sir. unconditional love is infinite, infinite, how infinite love. It's just more and more and more and more. You can't ask for enough and, and, and not have it given to you. you. You'd ask for more and more and more, and it will still get more and more and more. There is no limit. There are no limitations in the light. That much I know for sure at all. Yeah. And and that that love sounds to me like it's it's all accepting, but it's also all transforming. And I've heard it described that way recently uh, through through an experience uh, of a, of a brother named Nelson who, who met with Holy Spirit in heaven, and he was he was told that by Holy Spirit that it's a love that's all consuming, all consuming fire of mm -hmm. God. You know, it's a it's a love that's all accepting and all transforming. Yes, the the spirit said, uh, "Is it not loving to see everything in its most holy, pure form?" And that's what the love of God does. That's what the fire of God does. That's exactly what I wanted to say, but a different way is that that's what was happening with me and Rosalind is that it compels a perfected state. So it is going to correct anything that is not of the light. And God's perfect. So if it's not of the light, it's going to get corrected. And it's not anything to fear at all. It's wonderful. It just absolutely feels great. Uh, why would I want to keep all of this in, imperfection? You know, I don't. I'm, I'm ready to move into that one day and stay there. I don't want to come back. Um <laughs> I think I can help more people from over there than I ever could here. Uh, but right now I'm here. So I'm doing what I think is the next right thing uh, and try to be a, a ambassador of the light as best as I can. Good, good, good. Ambassador of the light, living that, that love and that light. You know, I, I see that living by the love is just put simply by Jesus when he said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's a very proactive approach on loving people well yeah. it's real simple just go be loved don't be selfish uh, you know that's it it's just go be loved love is the most powerful thing in existence it is a real force i experienced all of it and and then more on an infinite scale i, I wish i could express to you that that power and uh one day we will all be 
totally connected and integrated with all of that. Yes, so. and purified too. You know, a lot of people who are walking around with a guilty conscience. I mean, David wrote, and I wrote, I, I remembered this recently. He wrote in Psalm 32, how blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Like, like for the Lord to to cleanse right. us and render us all innocent by by well ultimately by his sacrifice on the cross where he displayed that that infinite perfect love of the father for all of humanity you know he understood that we're all connected and that what we do to one we do to everyone that's what he meant on the cross when he said forgive them father for they know not what they do he knew they didn't understand that and he loved them anyway and said don't make them experience what they've done to me that's the power of love and he took it all on himself for us. Amen. That's the power of forgiveness. And I, I I firmly believe, and I know this to be true, forgiveness will heal the world. And it's it's the first step in loving, really. Yeah. And acceptance. Yeah. yeah. And then once we all figure out this is all our own mess that we created <laughs> and and God didn't intend for any of this for us. It's because of our, our our inability to connect and stay connected and and understand who and what we truly are. We've chosen to look another direction for so long. We've forgotten who we are and what we are. And I'm beginning to remember, and that's why I'm having these experiences. So, and others like me, I'm not by far at all the only one out here. I don't claim that at all. I'm just. Uh, still trying to understand it all as best as I can. I think I've learned a lot, but I don't know an inkling of what I need to know. I know that. So it's just keep on keeping on. If I never quit, then I cannot fail because my victory becomes inevitable. It's a simple way to look at it. So I don't ever give up. You know, as the scripture says, a righteous man falls down seven times, but gets back up again. And I would love to just highlight, highlight you know, who we are as sons of God, the, the scripture speaks of in Roman, Romans chapter eight about the revealing of the sons of God. And, and I really see that that's, that's an intricate part of what we're coming into here, this season of this great awakening, which some have said will last, yes. this great awakening will last up and up until Jesus returns. So this is only getting better. And it's prophetically true in the scriptures when we look at the scriptures like of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. You know, like his kingdom is like a little leaven hidden in a lump of dough that the cosmos, right, that permeates the whole dough. I was going to talk about that permeation. That's what happened to it. That love and that light compels anything that is not like it to become like it. And it, and it corrects all uh, things that are not like that, it eliminates it. It's just gone. It annihilates it, literally. It's not a painful thing at all. It's it's an annihilated in freedom at the same time as the ultimate freedom. I'll tell you what, I defended freedom, right, for 22 years in the United States Navy. First time I ever really felt free was when I was standing in the light. That's real freedom. This is bondage we're living in here. And, uh, it's a form of bondage, but it's also love lessons and, and a lot of other things. But this is not who we truly are. It's not our true home. Um, and because of that, um, I, we're not free. We're, we're trapped in our own situation. And uh, we don't have to be. We have to turn our attention elsewhere, right? What we put our attention on, so we become. So mankind's got his attention on all kinds of things that have nothing to do with God. And though we have chaos in the world, that light is coming and Jesus is coming with it. And it's going to sweep through everything just like it did me and Roslyn that day. But it's going to be the entire planet. Everything on it, in it and over it. That's coming. God, I'm just, man, I wish people understood what God could really do. <laughs> Amen. It's coming. <laughs> Let's wait for it. And, uh, and in the meantime, I got I still have my own love lessons. I try to understand to the best of my ability as, as my life goes on. 
Yes, this is why the scripture says to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the light of the world. And the one who is the light of the world has said to all of us, you are the light of the world. You know, and I think it's important that some of the, the teachings that you've come across, like St. Germain, like the I am discourses. Um, could you talk more yeah. about that and what you've gleaned from that, what you've learned about um, our own identity through what um, the Lord was revealing? So St. Germain and him? Jesus know each other intimately as best friends. Um, so the I am discourses is a little book that's a little booklet that's real thin. Basically, the words I am, I am is the full activity of God. Those are the first two words spoken, and it invokes the full power of God. And when we say I am this or I am that, we are co-creating whether we realize it or not. And, this, and, the, and the, these books teach about how the energy flows through to us from above, and it's perfect. It's perfect energy when it comes to us, right? But because of our uh, imperfect thoughts, we requalify that energy with imperfection, and then we manifest imperfection because we changed it. And if we would just get our consciousness out of the way and let it flow through, it would manifest perfection, just like it did that day for me and Rosalind and our unborn son and our body within our bodies. And uh, that's all the proof I needed. It's all about the energy. Everything's energy, right? And light is energy. And light is more than just energy. It's, intel it's an intelligent substance. The place I was taken to was pure light. And it was God's intelligence, all of it, and more, infinite intelligence. Um, so that's what we are. And uh, I don't know how to put it into words. It's just kind of... I highly recommend studying these books, <laughs> let's put it that way. My life's totally changed. And by the way, I was seeking answers for like 33 years or something before I found these books, or well, they found me, maybe is a better way to say it. Um, and over the years, I would read this or that, and I would see that some of it was true, but not all of it. And to me, a half of truth is still a lie. And uh, so I would go through all these different religions over and over and over until I got to this, uh, to the St. Germain information. And uh, I, have, I have not stopped reading them or studying them now in about eight or nine years since I found them. And uh, I don't need to study anything else. They fit perfectly with what I experienced in the light when I was there. So I told you I knew I would know, I, I would know it when I found it, but I didn't know what it was going to look like or how I was going to find it. But I knew when I found it, I would know it, and I and this is it. I'm just grateful it's happening to me, and I, I, I want to go home. I want to stay there one day and help bring everybody else home. That's really my ultimate goal. Amen to that. Amen to that. You know, I'm excited about what God is doing in the world. He is waking us up, and I've found that a lot of people are spiritually hungry, and they kind of know intrinsically what what fellowships should look like you know, and, and what they a lot of people describe and what they want is exactly what the Bible says. When you come together, one has a song, one has a teaching, everybody gets to play when when we gather to, for fellowship, right. you know, and, I, and I'm like, oh, this is so fascinating. This is what's on God's heart. We can't do church as usual when, when God has something else in mind. I've been part of this men's Bible group, uh, Bible study. It's not even a, really a Bible study. It's a men's group where we, where Holy Spirit just yeah. gets to play with his kids, with his sons, with his boys. And it's just so amazing. And if we could do that, if we could just let Holy Spirit have have his way, whatever, you know, to... Well, that's just... the uh, cognitive dissonance part, you know, that people... Because they fear lack of loss of control, I think, is what it is. Um if the loss of control means what I experienced, I'm all for it. <laughs> so, but I didn't know that until I had those experiences. You know, I had these, you know, the the angry God and all of that that I was taught when I was growing up. And that's just not what I experienced at all. And uh, no, first of all, 
I knew when I was there that no negative expression of any kind is allowed in the presence of the Creator. It's not, not nothing is going to disrupt disrupt God's peace ever. Nope. So, any any kind of thought that is not uplifting and loving is just simply not there, not allowed there, never going to be there. And that's, that's why, and I don't know about hell. I've never experienced any of that, but if it's, if it's everything I experienced, then none of that existed. Uh, just didn't. I don't know how else to put it in words. That's just been my experience. And I get yelled at sometimes because I don't believe sometimes that there's a hell, but I think our hell is what we're living right now <laughs> in a certain way. I mean, it's hard here. It's painful. It's uh, um, always a struggle of some sort, physical, emotional, mental, whatever, um, but not there. Absolute, pure perfection and ease there is no struggle. It's effortless. Oh, I would love to ask you a question. Having met God for yourself in that encounter and experiencing that unconditional love, is it even imaginable that that everyone wouldn't be saved in the end? That's exactly what I think. I mean, there's, we're, I'm, I know what God felt for me, and it's the same for everyone. It, no, God doesn't differentiate between his children but with his love i'm going to dish a little more out over here than over here no it's not how it works it's all about how much we're willing to receive and accept into our lives of god's love that's the real throttle that's that's throttling it back it's our own selves not the other way around and uh and these books teach all those kind of things and i'm so grateful i learned about them and been studying them since this long um and they fit perfectly with what I experienced. So I don't, I don't need to go seek any other answers. I just need to keep learning them in these books because they fit with what I've experienced. And we have to call in the light too. And and there is a process for that. They've got a lot of different decrees uh, that the St. Germain community does. And in doing that, you're putting your mind on your creator and it's pulling in to be more like God. And I can literally feel I'm sensitive to the light now when I'm, doing that i can feel it not as powerfully as it you know did when i was with Roslyn or or when i crossed over but i know it's happening and it's been healing me physically on the inside i've got a lot of military injuries from the military uh and that's been a whole lot better uh the last few years um i still struggle with that but nothing like a before uh so back out on the golf course i can walk the course and hit a drive 270 yards so i'm happy with that at my age <laughs> um the, the healing continues it just always does till we're perfected in in, in that state with jesus and saint germain and all the other ascended masters and then uh and then it goes on forever after that so yeah <laughs> i love forever <laughs> That's beautiful. I'm looking forward to all that the Lord has for us. You know, and I, I love something you said earlier about like he creates a permanent change, you know, that that mm -hmm. it's not it's not a work that uh, that we can we can screw up in the end, that he's got us, you know, that sense no. of security and, and, and belonging in the family, you know, and, and all of that. And that it's ever increasing yep. glory from one glory to the next, as the scriptures declare. It's one blessing after another. It's grace heaped upon more grace, you know, into our it's, lives. Right. It's it's infinite, infinite um, gifts. You know, God never stops pouring out his gifts. We just have to receive them. So that's the problem it's literally us that are the problem it's not the other way around <laughs> and we have to it's the cognitive dissonance not you know it's like oh ooh, that sounds woo woo to me get used to it because one day you're going to have to admit that woo woo is real <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> and call it whatever you want label it whatever you want it, it's real and it's it's you're going to have to deal with it one day we all will and that's just uh, it's that simple 
And God's going to have our backs. He has all our backs. We may not understand that on that level, but he does. And that's, that's enough. And yes, I see it as, as he's loving the hell out of us. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he'll continue Excellent. to do so until, <laughs> until the very end when, when God says in his word, the last enemy to be defeated is death. Any sense of separation, you know, that he is he is reconciling all the world to himself. And and I've actually come to see in scripture this message of ultimate reconciliation, you know, and that even some of the 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 translations haven't even worded it right because we misinterpret like what eternal punishment is is. Right. You know, when the word is actually <laughs> aeonion, that's the Greek word, and colossus, you know, and 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 when you look at the words, it actually means age-lasting chastisement, that there's a reconciliatory element to this. There's a redemptive end in mind to anything we go through, all the yeah. love love lessons, right? We make it more complicated than it really should be. That's, that's the problem, you know. Yeah. Uh, God's love is simple. It's just pure love. You know, one day my daughter uh, and her friend was over at the house, and her name, friend's name is Lauren, and my daughter's Leela. And Leela, some, somehow the subject of um, how much I love her came up. And I said, yeah, I love you. I love you tremendously. And she goes, and I said, she said, what about Lauren? She goes, well, I love Lauren, too. She goes, but you love me more. I said, no, I can't do that. She goes, well, why not? I said, because love just is. And then Lauren goes, hmm. <laughs> I had that sensation of, of that real revelation, that realization that once we get the Father's love, we're going to start adopting everyone as if they're our own dearly beloved children, you know, like adopting other kids. I love you like my own, you know, that when you experience and channel yeah. the Father's love like that, you're going to start to love like that and really display what the right. heart of heaven really is. Yeah. And it's just... That's why I said earlier, go be loved. That's the only answer. Um, the problem with that is in the world we live in is the people that are, is when people are not ready to receive it. And you get the love that you allow. And, uh, and that becomes a complex back and forth. If, if, and with the energy thing, if you're not careful, uh, so just, you know, you know how to be discerning, just be more discerning. It really is what I'm saying. Uh, you don't want to go out there and just try and love the whole world. And uh, it, although we can do it from your heart, you got to be discerning when you're acting on it. That's all I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Because um, some people are out there to take advantage of you. And I've had that happen too. So I just want to put that warning out there. Yes. Know who you're talking to over time. Be discerning. Uh, you'll know. You get better at it over time. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for bringing that to our attention, because I really believe we we are guided and led by the Holy Spirit. That's where our discernment comes from. We're going to get help from heaven on how to implement the love. And especially when we remain humble and submitted, you know, and 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 guided like we're the like we're the toddlers in the room. We, we become childlike and humble in that way and, and let our let our love be guided by by God. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're talking about one of the most important things that the world can hear about the love of God and about, you know, just being that love. That's our, that's our takeaway. Be the love and manifest yes. love because you are love. You're created by love and for yes. love. You're created exactly. to be loved. So start receiving that love. Uh, don't be one who doesn't open your heart to receive and, that love and be transformed. And own it. Own it. Claim ownership of it. Claim the ownership. I am love. Amen. That's a statement that also inv invokes the full activity of God. That's what Jesus is saying. I am the life and the resurrection. That's what he was saying. Same thing. I am. Yeah, yeah he, he modeled that for us in the Gospel of John. There's several I am statements going through there, and we can join him and and live out of him the i am uh series of books saint germain series you know talk about that about being like that and uh it just oh, i wish i could put it all into words in, in a simple manner but it's 
I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but I appreciate you uh, inviting me on. on and uh, God bless you, Daniel, and, uh, and your family. And uh, thanks again. Appreciate it. Oh,